Hey guys, my name is Sam Marion, and today we are going to be talking about some strategies in order to support the executive function of emotion regulation for, I'm going to focus on students, but everything I talk about today basically will apply um, for adults, sort of for, for everybody, okay? But I will use most of my examples to be more in a school setting. So uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking about cognitive load theory which is really, it's, it's more of a theory uh, and a concept aimed around the executive function of working memory, but we're gonna apply it to a bigger picture of emotion regulation, okay? So what is cognitive load theory? This was a theory developed by an Australian um, educational psychologist by the name of John Sweller. And in short, the basic concept here is that Every task has cognitive load, right? And there are two parts to it. There's the intrinsic load, which is the mental effort, the work you have to do in order to complete the task. Then there is the extraneous load, which for people who are neurodivergent, who maybe have learning differences, learning disorders, learning disabilities, the extraneous load is all the extra brain power energy work that has to be done in order to complete the task combined that is a cognitive load so here's a quick easy example let's say we have a paragraph with information to to learn the goal is to memorize information hand this handout to two different people I'm going to use a close friend of mine as an example he will tell you he has an almost photographic memory. So he'll look at this paper, he will, he will read it very quickly, and he will retain almost all the information. Like that. Hand me the paper. I have very low reading comprehension. So I have, track, I have tracking challenges. My eyes bounce around the paper. Um, I do very, I can do a decent job reading a narrative, but in reading factual stuff where I may inadvertently have my eyes sort of bounce around and I, I read something incorrectly, I don't know that it's incorrect. It's not piecing a narrative together. So I may read it three or four times at a slow pace because I'm a slow reader, my eyes jump around in order to try to tease out what are the facts. Then I put so much energy, brain power into just reading that remembering the information is much more limited. So that's the working memory part of it. And you can see how much greater the cognitive load is on my brain than it is on my close friend's brain. Right. And I think that, that, that general attracts for people. This is something that I've been teaching in my office here recently since I've, since I've learned more about it. And it does make a lot of sense for folks. And so for the parents of divergent learners, for the parents of students who have learning differences, learning challenges, learning disabilities, they can quickly see, yes, my child has to work much harder. Their brain has to work much harder to complete these basic tasks. Now, the one brain may have a hard time in English class, but not in math class. So the cognitive load is not the same for every subject or for every assignment, but it does vary. Each person experiences it differently. And the basic theory is around like the more cognitive load the task requires of a person, that it starts to, to drain on their working memory, our ability to retain it for a short period of time and then for longer periods of time as well. That it place an undue burden on some students. The goal is to learn the fact about owls, and instead this person is getting burned out just trying to read the paper. And so we can really conceptualize for students building some scaffolding. This is where individualized education plans come in and really structuring classwork, coursework, tasks, activities to be accommodated and supported so that we can minimize the extraneous load. And on individual class levels, this is what we look at a lot. And like I said, for many people that I've talked about this, that kind of clicks for folks. Um, the, the person who's using brain power just to sit still in their chair compared to the person who sits still very naturally, one of those takes more power, right? More energy. One of these is more draining frequently. Now, we don't know what's going on inside the person who's sitting there still. Their, their brain may also be draining for different reasons. Okay, so that's, that's the basic concept of cognitive load theory and how it impacts working memory. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about the motion regulation part. Now, I want to jump back, I guess, talk about executive functioning. Depending on whose research you look at, there are at least six different categories where up here is executive function, and we use it in this big blanket term a lot, but really we can break it down into at least six categories, working memory being one. One of them I want to focus on, though, is emotional regulation. I'm a therapist. This is an academic theory, right? But I come to this as a therapist, and honestly, I tend to view emotional regulation not as an executive functioning or as an executive function. I tend to view emotion regulation as a prerequisite for executive functioning. I view that emotion regulation must be in place in order for the other executive functions to work, for them to function, uh, for them to excel, uh, for them to be maximized. Because when we are emotionally dysregulated within our brain, the part of our brain that's going to do the coursework, that kind of rational thinking part of the brain, it's not online. So this is why the child who's highly anxious in the classroom is not paying attention in an order in a, in a very effective manner. They need help settling first. Maybe they need to have their needs addressed. But the emotion regulation is a really big part. By the way, emotion regulation, the ability to kind of regulate your emotions, but to manage them, to engage with them. Sometimes being emotionally regulated does mean panic. Uh, it means we sort of connect with that. That oftentimes, and I hear this especially in, in educational settings, regulated gets used or emotionally regulated gets used to mean calm, settled, manageable, compliant, doing what the teacher or personnel or whoever wants them to be doing. That may actually that may not be regulated. And uh, autistic masking is a very real thing. Uh, and I have video on that as well. Um, and so the child may be in complete turmoil inside, but look very compliant and look regulated when in fact they're not at all, that they're, they're not calm. Uh, so that, that's a whole thing too. So um, what we know, and, and there are many, many factors that impact emotional regulation. Sensory input very easily leads to a student being emotionally dysregulated. But also sensory input can wear on, uh, it can kind of add to somebody's cognitive load, right? It can add to the extraneous load because you're sitting in class and there's some kind of a buzz going on over here. Or maybe the teacher said, hey, y'all have some quiet reading time. I'm going to play some, some music. Uh, we had quiet reading time in my eighth grade class and the teacher would play Kenny G, which is fine music. Um, but if you're easily distracted and have a hard time focusing and you're hearing saxophone runs all over the place, you may have a hard time keeping your eyes going across the paper during quiet reading time. Uh, we'd have 20 minutes of that every day in eighth grade. Um, so that's a sensory input, though. The sound, smells, trying to navigate through that. These can add to the cognitive load as you're trying to distract yourself from whatever other things that are happening. Maybe your student, the student's still doing their coursework and everybody else already done theirs. A lot of theirs are getting turned in. And so now they're kind of whispering with themselves. And it's now we're also getting on the focus um, category of executive function. So there's a lot of interplay here. There really is. Uh, and because of that, it sort of adds to that cognitive load. Now the brain is trying to like tune this out or like ignore certain things, yet stay focused. The extraneous load is just up, 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 up for the divergent learner, for the divergent student. Or employee, right? This, you see how this fits in the workplace. And as that builds throughout the day, as that load does, because it's not like, okay, cool, I finished math. Now my brain is like, boom, reset, totally calm and not burdened anymore. That may be first period, second period, and you've got six, seven periods in the day, and the brain is getting worn out. In the same way that just because you walk for a minute during a marathon doesn't mean you're fully rested. You may catch your breath a little bit, but you're not fully rested. I've run some. I promise you that walking at mile three or mile 20 did not give me all of my energy back. In the same way, changing classes doesn't either. Getting into a new environment may make a difference. The material may make a difference, but the brain still gets more and more worn out. And so how effective a person is as a student at the end of the day 
is not the same as they may be earlier in the day. And so when we start to conceptualize supports and accommodations, that's when we, I think, we need to look at it, not just the scaffolding to support a, a learner so that, that they have the, a more equal effort towards completing the task in their second period class, in that English class, whether they're handed out this, this passage to read. It's not that. But our goal is to help that brain have scaffolding all throughout. So even though there's maybe a class that, oh, hey, they're doing fine in here. We don't need so much support. They might. The student might. But we really, really need to evaluate that. Our goal is to evil, even the playing field. This is a person who has significant asthma who uses an inhaler before a race. They're not getting an advantage. They're getting scaffolding to equalize the playing field. They're getting support. I talked to some parents recently about a young person and about a combination at school. And the, and the language that they were using was brain breaks. The kid gets brain breaks a couple times a day. And that helps them get to the end of the day. I said, that's great, right? And, and parents are excited. Yeah, we're really happy with this. My child gets to the end of the day. However, I kind of raised the question, well, is your goal for the child, your child to thrive for seven or eight hours of school? Or do you want your child to thrive through the, through the whole day? see it. And I see that a lot from folks. We get in the mindset and many families, many parents and, and the students themselves, school can be so challenging. Certain environments can be so challenging. The goal becomes simply survival. If we can get through this really major challenging thing, seven hours a day, five days a week, if we can get through that, that's such a big deal. And so often when a, and somebody ends up with an identity or a diagnosis that leads to some supports and accommodations, that makes a major difference. And suddenly those seven hours become manageable again. Thriving? No, but managing. Maybe eventually closer to thriving. And this isn't just around learning differences. Uh, I can tell you stories of people who like their eyes got checked. Oh, you're having trouble seeing. They get glasses. And they're walking in the classroom to find out there's things in the classroom that they never knew. There was like homework reminders up on the board. If you remember the days of all handwritten reminders and not electronic. Oh, there's homework reminders up there. That would help me get my homework turned in a little better if I had known that. So it's not just around learning differences. Sometimes it's things just like eyesight that can make a difference. But our goal is to thrive just through school. But it's all day. So... Just because we have enough scaffolding in place, the combination support in place to help this person get to the end of the school day, I want us to, to consider that cognitive load just through this lens right now. How can we make sure there's enough scaffolding? Just because they can do well enough in a class doesn't mean that they are doing really well in the class. doesn't mean they're thriving. And sometimes there may be a class that a kid's really interested in the subject matter, the material, but they're so burned out by the end of the day when they get there or middle of the day when they get there that they can't even enjoy this, this material that they really do want to enjoy and love. Cognitive load theory. If we can minimize the extraneous load throughout the day. Now, parents, this may start at home in the morning. Are there things you can do that can lessen some of that cognitive load on your young person? before they even get to school. This can look mean things like, it can look like picking out an outfit the night before. Now, I get it. Things like that don't always work. You are not always able to convince a person to pick out an outfit the night before. And you're not always able to convince a person to choose to wear that outfit that they picked out the night before. We don't have to go far to find examples of people that we know who aren't going to do it. They can pick it out with you, but they're not going to wear it, right? But we can try. Maybe we pick out a couple options of things, um, a few tops, a few pants that they can choose from. So they still feel like they have options in the morning. I'm the kind of person who I travel for work and I may take four shirts and I'm going to need a nice shirt for one day. Um, things like that. So I get it. I have gone to a wedding with 
three shirts and five ties just in case. So I didn't know what I would want to wear the next day for the wedding. I get it. But we can make efforts. At least I only had a few options left. Can narrow it down. Okay? Get someone to school. We can plan out breakfast. We can plan out lunches in advance. Maybe this is a few minutes on Sunday afternoon. We can make some plans to lessen that cognitive load. We can think about the sports of school. How much do we require a child to remember things for school um, when it could be communicated to the family in a different way? Maybe there's an extra email that goes out, right? Uh, maybe we put in reminders. So you could forget their lunchbox at school. I have a kid who forgets his lunchbox at school sometimes. So in his like take home notebook or a little folder he brings home every day, but when he takes his lunch to school, he puts a reminder in there. He does it. So when he's packing up at the end of the day, oh yeah, I get my lunchbox. Little reminders. There's a lot of things we do as adults like that. All day long. I have a to-do list. I have multiple to-do lists. Always. So that when I have a moment, I can know what I can be doing. I can look at it. Okay, that's what I need to do next. So we put in reminders that sort of get into the next task and all the executive functionings, all the executive functions, they add to our cognitive load. If you have challenges around getting organized and so trying to, or initiation, so what should I do next? I'm not sure. I'm looking at all my stuff. Our brain is having to work hard to come up with this. I have another uh, video where I talk about uh, using some, some day planners and sort of even simplifying down to, to smaller note cards so that we see less options. That's lessening the cognitive load, the extraneous load of choosing what to do next or finding our way to the next task. The more we can do things like that, the better chance we have to thrive throughout the entire day. The better chance your students have throughout the, throughout the whole day. Some of these things, yeah, combinations are very real and needed. And we need the school to do it. We need schools to help with this. We may need your workplace to help with that. Some, a young person can do on their own. And families can support. We can find balance in all this. Okay, sensory is a big deal. Limiting the sensory input throughout the school day, having breaks, sensory breaks, that can lessen the cognitive load. Our brain can settle for a little bit, can get out of full sprint and jog some. Does it give you all your energy back? No. But can you catch your breath? Yes. Okay, so I hope this has been helpful. A little bit about cognitive load theory. It's a longer video, uh, but I did want to go a little more in depth and give some examples uh, of ways that, that we can use this theory. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a platform, it's a foundation that really can be built upon. And I hope you're able to do that. Uh, I hope that if this content has been meaningful. I hope you give me a like, uh, subscribe, check me out on Instagram, at Sam Mary Counseling, same handle over there. Uh, give me a like and follow over there. I've got similar content. I hope to connect with you. If you have any questions, or any ideas for future content, I hope you will let me know, maybe in the comments below, uh, or reach out to me, that I really want this channel to be one that is directly responding to the wants and needs of um, the people out there. Whether you are a professional who's trying to figure out how to better support the own families you're working with, maybe you're a teacher, maybe you're a parent, maybe you are a neurodivergent person who's just trying to find support for yourself. But I hope all this is helpful, and thank you for, um, thank you for giving me some of your time. That means something to me.